Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Facilitated by renowned educators, ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts. Please be sure to listen to our important message following this episode regarding the risks of investing in exchange-traded options. Welcome, everyone. This is Steve Meisinger, your host for today's ISC webinar. Today, I'm really happy that we have Jack Crooks with us. Jack's the president of Black Swan Capital. He really understands the currency markets. He follows the fundamentals as well as the technical, and he'll be discussing the next currency move, what's next for the U.S. dollar. Without further ado, Jack Crooks. Jack, thanks for joining us. Hey, Steve. Thanks again for having me. Um, always appreciate it. Um, and thank you for all your guests coming in today for spending some time with us. Um, hopefully I can share something with you you haven't seen before, but if you followed some of my webinars, you know, you've probably seen some of this before. But I'm going to talk about a little bit about what's going on in the background and the thematics of this uh, so-called currency war and really what the main driver is. The main driver is what it's been for the last couple of years. It's just that the, uh, the, the international press seems to be catching on to it finally. Um, and we're starting to see it uh, in the headlines. Going to talk about that, and really what our view is uh, for the dollar. Trying to trying to look for a kind of a different view outside of the market view. Um, looking for some things um, to click uh, in the background. Fundamentally, um, just changes pr from a cooperation standpoint globally um, that may help the dollar. Um, and uh, that's the scenario that we're we're looking for here. So let me just get started, and we go through them one by one. There's our disclaimer. Uh, there's a disclaimer for the ISE. And this is the IFE FX options menu or list. Um, as you can see, the FX <coughs> options available on ISE cover all the major currencies and some of the, some of the minor currencies and exotics you can get access to, Mexican peso, um, New Zealand dollar, a little bit out of the ordinary, kind of, a, I guess you would consider that a, a minor major. And the Brazilian real, of course, would be considered a minor or an exotic emerging market currency. So it's quite a list, uh, quite, a, quite a nice list. Uh, it covers commodity currencies, covers the trading block currencies, covers the savings block currencies, you know, the, the European block, which we consider the savings block currencies. Um, so it, it's... What's good about these options, and, and I think it's, it's something that, that we've always said, uh, we like them for longer-term bets, and we like them just to buy some time to let something play out, and we like the fact that we know exactly what our risk is. Uh, you can use these options any way you want. You can short them. You can, you can do anything and any strategy here you can, you can do with a stock option. The only difference is the underlying, of course. Uh, we like them, as I said, because they, they're very good for our thematic setups. If we have a longer-term call uh, based on fundamentals and technical setups, uh, we keep it pretty simple. We either buy a put or buy a call on a particular option uh, and let the thematics play out and give us time to play out. Obviously, it can be a little expensive paying up for the premium, um, but again, that's, that's what you're paying for. You're paying for some time here to let these events play out instead of short-term trading. And that's why I don't really like these from a short-term trading perspective. You don't get the pricing efficiency you would get in the spot market, obviously. Not that you can't, and not that you can't get in and out of these at any point in time. You can. Um, but I think if you use them over an intermediate-term time frame, whatever strategy you use, I think you'll, you'll get the best bang for the buck here. So what's the driver of this whole currency war thing? You know, it's the same market driver that's been in in play for probably the last two years since the credit crunch. And this is idea of global rebalancing. Nothing new here. Now it's finally, as I said, making it to the headlines. And if you haven't seen what global balancing, <coughs> excuse me, rebalancing is, I'll go over it quickly here. Um, it just means the overconsumption countries are starting to rebalance with the overproduction countries. And that's really what the credit crunch was all about. The market got saturated, pushing all these dollars uh, into the surplus countries and said, hey, the game's kind of over here. Uh, the globe has to rebalance. It was out, we're out of balance in, in many, many aspects, not just overconsumption, overproduction, but <clears throat> relative savings in the world. 
relative to the debt and the leverage out there, uh, unbelievable uh, at a time when the credit crunch hit. And I use the number, I think uh, derivatives were about 20% of, of global GDP combined uh, back in 1988, 1985. Uh, end of 2007, uh, derivatives represented 989% of global GDP combined. So, nine, so from 20% to 980% of, of global GDP. That's a pretty big run-up in leverage and debt uh, in a world that um, has never seen anything close to that before in the past. And it really, this, this whole derivative process was grew out of global rebalance, the, the global imbalances problem. These surplus nations had massive amount of current account FX reserves that they didn't want to invest in their own country domestically. Some of them did, of course, and you have domestic investment, you have consumer growth, but relative to the size of their GDP and relative to uh, the growth in the export side of their economies, which was easier to keep going, they built up massive reserves. Part of that was due to the shock from 1997, 1998, uh, Asian crisis, and they funneled those reserves uh, back to the center, uh, back to the U.S., back to Europe, um, and our <clears throat> and our illustrious banks, and I guess you could call them. Uh, um, I don't know what the word would be. The rocket scientists that you know in the cellar of, of all our investment banks when we had investment banks churning out these derivatives like razor blades because of this massive amount of money being recycled back into the U.S. economy and capital markets back in the European capital markets, a lot of the stuff created out of London also, and sent out around the world to do its thing, not knowing how these things would react. But now, <clears throat> of course, we realize uh, how they've okay. reacted, and we have no more investment banks in the U.S. So, hey, Jack? Yes? I, can we just ask everybody what slide you're on? Because somebody, Patricia, is saying that she only sees the first slide. Just want to make okay. sure that everybody can see primary macro themes still, and that's what Jack's talking about. Can everybody see that? Otherwise, maybe we have a problem here. Can everybody just respond? Everybody sees that mac primary macro theme still? OK, great, great. Looks like, Patricia, your, your slides might be frozen. You might need to log in. Jack, sorry about that. I apologize. No problem. Thanks. And of course, the, the poster children for this global rebalancing are these two guys. The United States, the big overconsumption country, uh, China the big overproduction country, uh, and that's still really the driver here. Uh, this is uh, affectionately known by many as the G2 now of the world. This relationship uh, between these guys is what's going to determine either growth going forward or some type of conflagration depending how this relationship turns out. We also happen to have a rebalancing problem in Europe of their own right, and you can consider it as part of the Eurozone on one side of the fence and Germany, which is a massive surplus country, major export in the world on the other side of the fence, Germany sucking the wind completely out of the Eurozone. The Eurozone countries that are in trouble have to compete against Germany with the same currency, so they don't have the ability to use the currency to take this adjustment. Therefore, they have to take this adjustment uh, of over indebtedness and inefficiencies relative to Germany. They have to take this adjustment domestically through this, through deflation, basically, this austerity, even though Germany keeps blowing and going. Um, and obviously, the German taxpayers aren't happy with subsidizing these guys, and these guys aren't happy have, trying to compete with Germany locked in the straitjacket of the euro. So you have a major global <clears throat> imbalance in the eurozone itself. That's caused a lot of problems politically and will continue to cause problems going forward, especially if growth doesn't materialize and austerity uh, continues to bite. Uh, we're going to continue to see those uh, marches in the streets all over Europe, and ultimately we, we think this is going to peck away and peck away and continue to hurt the entire monetary system. Obviously, if we don't get some type of global demand surge in the world, that generates some wealth um, for the Eurozone countries that are trying to compete with Germany. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.